O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. That I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. God is still speaking if we listen for God's word. There is a form of life which we share with billions of creatures across time. Over many eons, hundreds of thousands of years, and across the geography of this planet, we share this mode of existence which has changed this planet through migration and alteration. This, t this thing that we call being human. Now this type of life that we call human has been reflected on for millennia, has been reflected on in, ad infinitum in terms of the particular features of it, what makes us different from other creatures. And the thing about this way of being is that each of us, whether we were born 10,000 years ago, a thousand years ago, 70 years ago, or last week, we share this thing. And it's something that we are born with and we carry throughout our life, something without which our lives at the end of the day are inexplicable. We can't explain them without referring to this thing. It is something that is so important to each of us that we build our entire worlds around it. In fact, one might even say that it has been the singularly most important thing in the unfolding of human history and what we have done with the world. It is what I will call the mirror. The mirror of awareness that the world of other human beings is looking at us, is looking at us ever and always. This awareness is cultivated throughout our lives so that it becomes, I would suggest, the center of obsession for our lives. Because of this awareness, it affects what we wear. Now, I could have worn a sackcloth today and I would have been just fine, or I could have worn a secondhand uh, T-shirt and a pair of jeans with sneakers and I would have been fine. But I think more of myself than that would have projected to the world. So what we wear, what we eat. Now, the corner deli is just about as good for anybody as anything else, but of course, we know that there are fine restaurants to be had in New Haven. So why would you go to the corner deli when you can go to one of the fine restaurants and be seen 
with the other people who are eating in those fine restaurants. Where we live. When we choose where we live, our zip code becomes as important as what it is that we need. Where we work, how we speak. One of the things about when we move through the different sort of dialects that we share is that frequently we can communicate much better if we don't necessarily pay attention to the grammatical rules that we learn, but simply talk in language that people understand. Yet, and I'm guilty of this myself, I choose the word that will betray my, how shall we put it, grooming, that will betray my education, that will betray my place in the world. So even the way we speak is because we want the world to see us in a particular way, because we want the world to reflect back to us what it is that we think of ourselves. We want the world to reflect back to us kindly about what it is that we feel about ourselves. Now the point being is that the awareness of being looked at shapes our lives and our worlds. In the areas of philosophy and the social sciences, we talk about this as the intersubjective space of identity formation. For those of you who don't know, every sermon you get a 75 cent word or a term. That's the term for today. The intersubjective space of identity formation, which simply means the place in which we discover who we are as individuals and are shaped by that. There was a great movie you all may remember a few years back called Now, and it starred Jodie Foster. And what it was about was a child that grew up and had no reference group and how different she was from everyone else. Because her mother, they lived in a, a remote part of Appalachia and her mother had died while she was young, so she had basically raised herself because she didn't have those mirrors to help her understand that clothes are supposed to do more than simply cover your body. She didn't have those intersubjective mirrors for her to understand that there are ways that you talk to people anticipating they will reply. She didn't have all of these mirrors that we take for granted. Now the point to notice here is that who we were, are, and likely will be is shaped by the awareness of being looked at by the world. Now here's the thing. If the reflection that you get back from the world is disapproval and scorn, along with a diminished sense of yourself, folks will likely create spaces within themselves and within their worlds where they can hide the precious parts of themselves from the slings and arrows of a hostile gaze. If when you move through the world and you show people who you really are, if what you receive is disapproval, if what you receive are people looking askance at you, you'll create little spaces for yourself to hide little spaces for you to hide the important places of yourself. Now this is nowhere more true than the deepest parts of people in terms of who they are and who they love and who they find as family. These are hidden in the closets of hearts, minds, and patterns of living because of the sure sense that even though the world is looking, and here's the important part. Even though the world is looking, if you feel that you are not being seen, if you feel that you are not being valued, if you feel that you are not being known at the deepest level of your being, then one of the ways that human beings deal with that is to hide those parts of us which gain disapproval. Hide those parts of us 
which make people frown. Hide those parts of us which make uh, uh, someone run and grab a Bible and start shaking at, it, shaking at us like that. It's the thing that makes us feel that we can't be ourselves. My late friend Dale Andrews, a uh, homiletics preaching professor down at Vanderbilt, always taught in his preaching that the point of a good homiletic, which simply means a good sermon, so you got two terms today, so, so this is a two for Sunday, that a good homiletic was not just talking about the problem. So it's not just looking at what is the issue in terms of mirrors when they become distorted and we hide ourselves because of that, but also to talk about the good news. So what is the good news in a world of distorted and broken mirrors? What is the good news in a world in which there are so many of our sisters, brothers, and kin who feel that they can't show themselves in public because the public will frown on who and what they are, because their families have frowned on who and what they are, because their friends have frowned on who they are becoming, because all of those that had been their mirrors had been mirrors that reflected a diminished self. What is the good news in a world of closets and gazes of scorn? It is simply this. God sees us, God knows us, and God loves us. You know, we can get so caught up there we go. We can get so caught up in the trivia of a few scattered texts that we find in the Bible that people who are peddlers of malice and hate always refer us to, and there are like six or seven of them. And if you hadn't noticed, the Bible is pretty thick. I mean, really, the Bible is pretty thick. So if, so if the best you can do is come up with six or seven little verses here or there, then you really have not made a persuasive point about anything other than you have a short attention span and you haven't read the whole thing. But the point is that we can get so caught up that we forget and lose sight of what is at the center of the Christian faith. And that is what we find in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. It didn't say that God so judged the world that God spent all of God's time following the minutia of everybody's life, seeing what you're doing here, seeing who's there, that, but rather God loved the world so much that God gave God's only begotten son. That's the core of the Christian faith, and that's what is the good news. Our text for this morning, our text for the month, reminds us that God knows us, every piece of us. God knows us, and God loves us. I want you to sit with that for a moment. Because often we feel as if what makes us lovable is what we do, what kind of person we are. I am guilty of that myself, in that I don't much care what somebody tells me what their faith is. I want to see what it looks like when it takes flesh and lives in the world. So I'm guilty of that myself. But scripture gives us a picture of God in our text this morning is that God knows you better than you know yourself. God knows you better than your mother knew you. God knows you. Now notice I didn't say God knew you because throughout our entire lives we are becoming who it is that we will be. And God knows us and God loves us to the depths of our being. Now sit with that for a moment, that God knows us and loves us in the depths of our being simply because we are. 
So we may feel as if we have to hide some parts of us from the rest of the world, but even when we make little closets in our heart, when we make closets in our lives, God has already been there and is there with us. So that's what the good news is. The good news is that in a world of distorted mirrors, that wants to look askance upon us because of who we love, because of who we choose to be our family, because of the world in which we choose to create so that we can find affirmation. Even in the midst of that world, God's love is always there. Now here's the piece I want to end up with, is that knowing that God knows you knowing that God loves you, knowing that in the depth of your being, God holds you in that love, is something in which you can find courage. Courage to live who you feel your spirit calling you to be. Courage to live into the great and glorious creation that God has made you. Courage to be able to walk through this world as if you are God's greatest gift because there is no other you and you have been given to all of us by God. So if I can leave you with one thought, it is that God's love God's love for the whole of you, you as you were, you as you are, you as you are becoming, is stronger and greater than any of the distorted or breaking mirrors that may have surrounded you. So I invite you to live out loud whoever you are, to live out loud however God has made you, to live out loud because in living out loud and in loving yourself, God's joy is so great that the world cannot contain it. Amen.